Hello, this is Rick Harnish. Thank you all for joining. Uh, this is the High Speed Rail Alliance, and I am the executive director. And uh, we're here today to talk about Chicago Access. Um, and thank you all for joining. Uh, we've got the chat going. If you have questions, we'll have questions at the end. Please use the question and answer for those. Uh, for those. And um, uh, we'll get started. So uh, the High Speed Rail Alliance, for a background for those who are starting new with us, um, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are supported by our members, people like you who want to make fast, frequent, and dependable trains happen all around the country. Uh, we strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high speed rail is what it does and what we need, why we need to build it and what steps we can take to make it happen. Uh, we educate folks like you and others and uh, through a variety of programs like this. And then we provide you the tools that you need in order to educate your leaders in state capitals and in Washington, DC. Uh, we believe in an integrated national network with sub-regional networks and statewide networks that use three different types of infrastructure. Shared use lines would probably be about 80%, and that's where you're uh, working very closely with private railroads to run uh, frequent on-time passenger trains um, in conjunction with freight trains. It has been proven to work in a number of cases in the United States. It can work across the country. Regional lines are typically where a government entity would take an existing line put it into public ownership and really amp it up for frequent passenger service. Uh, the Northeast Corridor is the best example of a regional line in this country, though Caltrain um, in California is working on one as well. And then high-speed lines are what really bring the juice to the party. So new infrastructure um, where trains are going 200 miles an hour with electrified trains, zero grade crossings, fences to keep people off of it. And this is what really changes the dynamics of how the entire network work. Um, and we would imagine regional lines and high-speed lines would make up about 80% of the network um, if we had a true federal program really working to do this nationwide. And then they all need to work together again in an integrated plan that connects regions together, big towns and small towns. And the best example of this to date is California's innovative uh, integrated rail plan for the state where they are intending to use high-speed rail as the catalyst for connecting the entire state with incredibly high frequency passenger trains and buses so that you'd be able to get from anywhere in the state to anywhere in the state uh, very quickly, affordably, and safely. So um, we have long been concerned about what do you do about Chicago. Uh, it is the uh, the hardest nut to crack in terms of how to create high frequency service in between the mountain ranges. It's also the highest leverage investments we can make. So we put together a proposal called Crossrail, which would create a regional line stretching from one end of Cook County to the other uh, to link the region to uh, downtown and O'Hare. Um, and we're very excited that Amtrak um, has proposed a couple of the key pieces in getting Crossrail started through their Chicago Access Program. I'm so very excited to have Joe Schachter here today. He's in charge of um, working with the states at Amtrak um, on their, their uh, state services. Um, spent uh, a goodly amount of time at IDOT in their, uh, in their intermodal division. Um, and most importantly, uh, was a board member uh, of the High Speed Rail Alliance prior to being at IDOT. So thank you, Joe, for joining us. Um, again, for folks, remember the questions go in the question and answers, and we'll get to those after Joe's doing the presentation. So Joe, please take it away. Thank you, Rick, very much. I assume you can hear me okay? Absolutely. Great. Let me share a screen then, and we will get started. Okay, is this, uh, is the presentation visible? It's visible. And then we'll put it in presentation mode. Yes, I'm going to do that. Okay. 
Oops. <laughs> Hold on just a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Excellent. There we go. Very good. And as, as Rick said uh, in his introduction, and I appreciate the, the kind words, and I certainly remember very fondly being on the, the board of the High Speed Rail, what was then the Midwest High Speed Rail Association uh, back uh, in the 20, 20 aughts. Um, but uh, at Amtrak, uh, we consider the Chicago Access Program uh, to truly be a, a transformative experience. It, it really is. Um, taking a lot of the uh, infrastructure issues that all of us I think are, are familiar with have been riding the trains through and experiencing for for decades and, and trying to uh, get them on a path toward resolution. So what I'm going to be talking about is first the application to the federal mega program that we submitted uh, with several partners back on May 23rd. And then we'll go through the details of both the Chicago Access and Michigan East components of the program, as well as the Chicago Union Station improvements that are also part of this, of this overall package. And, but really, we do consider this transformative uh, in terms of uh, moving us into a, a brand new era uh, of passenger train service here in the area. So first, let me review the um, the a mega program budget components. Uh, and here, I'm actually going to take my video off so there's less distraction. So, um, so the first, the first major category here is uh, the Chicago access elements. And there are four here. The key is the second one. This is a direct connection between the St. Charles Airline Bridge and our yards. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into some slides about that specifically. But we also include improvements at 16th Street uh, to better connect the St. Charles Airline to the Rock Island District. We build a new platform in Joliet and we acquire uh, some property in the Chicago area to make up for some of the property we lose with some of this construction in our yard. That's about 266 million we are estimating of this total. That's about $418 million. We then have a set of improvements uh, at CUS, uh, some of which are construction and final design, others are to get us through the initial stages of uh, design, and we'll go through those elements as well. And then finally, uh, in Michigan, uh, one of the uh, most congested portions of that particular corridor um, is between Niles and Glenwood Road in southwest Michigan on Amtrak's ownership uh, in the state of Michigan. So. We have funds in that for uh, design of uh, double tracking that segment as well. So in total, this far reaching program is 418 and a half million as budgeted. And at the, uh, at the end, I'll show you the kind of support that we have received uh, from local agencies to help uh, with the application uh, to, uh, to find the funds to, to get this work done. So let's move on then to uh, the next slide. There we go, the Chicago Access Program details. We start here by talking first about our overall vision for uh, connecting, uh, connecting the United States and centering that on the Midwest. This is the Amtrak Connexus plan for the Midwest. And as you can see, the hub of this really is in the Chicago area. Uh, the yellow lines are those lines that already exist and that we would enhance. Uh, through uh, this, not only the access program, but additional improvements thereafter. But you can also see a number of new routes that we, we and or our state partners uh, have in mind, uh, ranging from here in Illinois, uh, IDOT's plans to go to Moline, and then we hope Iowa City at some point, that would of course involve the state of Iowa in those discussions, service to Rockford, but then up in Wisconsin, uh, new services to Madison, extending the Hiawatha to Green Bay, uh, creating a second uh, route to Minneapolis through Eau Claire. And then, of course, uh, in the near future, uh, we'll be starting the, uh, the new uh, second round trip between here and Minneapolis along the Empire Builder route. But the plan also includes service down to restore service, I should say, down to Indianapolis and beyond. 
Uh, we think that that former Hoosier State Corridor is ripe uh, for really good passenger train service. Uh, the service that was provided in the past, of course, as we know, was quite slow and unreliable. We would uh, like to bring that back at some point. And the access program allows, gives us more flexibility to do that. But we even have plans to uh, create a, a mini hub in Cleveland, uh, as you can see out east. But the bulk of the activity really is centered here in Chicago. And as Rick mentioned up front, you have to fix Chicago to do really just about anything else uh, here in the Midwest. So let's get into some detail here on what the Chicago Access Program is all about. And I will try and use my cursor here to illustrate this as best I can in the absence of a laser pointer. Just to orient all of you, uh, this is the view of our yards just south of Union Station. Here's the south branch of the Chicago River. Here's Lake Michigan over here. Uh, this is McCormick Place right here. And the way our trains work today, first on the Champaign and Carbondale routes, as well as uh, the uh, city of New Orleans, we do an antiquated move where we come out of, uh, if we're going, uh, if we're leaving Chicago, we normally will leave CUS, we will head down uh, the blue, uh, here we go, the blue route through the yard, we then start a antiquated backup maneuver that adds 10 to 15 minutes to all of our run times for these trains, where we go all the way west on the Metro BNSF trackage, we then switch tracks, and then go on uh, the St. Charles airline across the river on the bridge, and then finally we get uh, to the CN Lakefront line and head on down uh, via McCormick Place. But this whole spaghetti here costs us 10 to 15 minutes, as I said, of running time. Now, those of you who are, are, uh, are quite knowledgeable about current rail operations know that the airline bridge is currently out for repair. Um, it's a short-term repair. It's not something that's uh, structurally a problem. It's a problem with a cable cut of the signal system. So CN and CSX are currently working to get that fixed uh, with, uh, with us. So currently then we perform another goofy backup maneuver to get out of, of Chicago, where instead of using uh, uh, the, uh, the Western move, instead we go all the way South across the 21st Street Bridge. Then we get on the CN Freeport sub and then eventually connect with the airline up here. This too costs us 10 to 15 minutes. Meantime, on our other routes, our Michigan and East Coast trains uh, go from, uh, once they reach 21st Street, we hit NS ownership, and then we are on the NS Chicago line, one of the most congested freight corridors in the country, all the way through Northwest Indiana until we can reach uh, our ownership in Porter, uh, Indiana. And our St. Louis trains uh, take the CN Heritage Corridor, another very busy freight corridor with four at grade rail to rail freight intersections uh, down to Joliet. So our current operation is just fraught with either uh, antiquated backup moves, moves onto congested freight railroads and so on that make trips out of Chicago already, already can put them uh, in position of great significant delay before they've even gotten anywhere. Or conversely, trains that have been running on time until they get here uh, can often be delayed coming into the last 30 or 40 miles into Chicago, whether it's on the NS Chicago line or the Heritage Corridor or whatever. Uh, our trains just tend to get held up here. So what we want to do first is build a brand new connection. This has been talked about for quite some time. Uh, and we have done a feasibility study with HDR, local engineering firm. The, this new connection is feasible, whereby we would build a, uh, a ramp coming up. Once it gets to the height of the St. Charles Airline Bridge, it then turns to uh, the south, meets the, meets the airline's south track, goes over the bridge, uh, and then uh, heads on uh, to the, to the uh, lakefront line. It eliminates this whole peach colored BNSF move or the NS move for the uh, Carbondale and City of New Orleans trains. 
but it also opens up a brand new world for us in terms of creating new routes out of Chicago or into Chicago for both the St. Louis trains and the Michigan trains as well. For example, the St. Louis trains, instead of having to get on the CN to go to the Heritage Corridor down to Joliet, can instead take this new connector and then on their, our upgraded connection, whoops, our upgraded connection uh, to the Rock Island, uh, move to uh, the Metro Rock Island line, which I think as all of you know, is slated for a significant expansion in the next few years. And we'll get into that in a second. And we're already starting to work with Metro on putting our uh, trains uh, on the rock uh, at, uh, in the future. In meantime, then, the Michigan trains, instead of having to go on the NS South uh, over to Porter, could also use the connector, get on the lakefront line, and then not on the map is after it turns to the south, uh, it meets up with uh, the South Shore, NICD, down at 115th in Kensington. And we have started discussions with NICD about uh, moving uh, Michigan trains uh, over to NICD through Northwest Indiana, uh, and then over to our ownership in Michigan City. Again, the goal here is to take our trains off of very congested corridors and on to uh, either less frequently used freight corridors or passenger friendly uh, railroads uh, for dispatching purposes. So in summary then, uh, by building this brand new connection and again in yellow uh, from our yards to the airline bridge, the St. Charles Airline Bridge, we want to achieve shorter running times. We are sure we will get greater reliability uh, as Rick mentioned, we, are, we, along with Metra, share a vision along with the city of Chicago to create a, uh, an efficient direct link between O'Hare, uh, CUS, and McCormick Place. This new connecting ramp makes that possible. Um, we will eliminate that 10 to 15 minute backup maneuver that I would describe. We can move other routes to more passenger friendly territory. Um, and off of freight railroads that are very congested uh, in the Chicago area. I mentioned uh, the Metro Rock Island service. I like putting in this slide simply because it shows how uh, we believe in the CREATE freight infrastructure program, uh, freight infrastructure improvement program as well. And our top priority is to get uh, the second half of the 75th Street corridor improvement program completed so that uh, the Metra Southwest service has a connection then uh, to get onto the Rock Island, that, and then, that then triggers Metra to be uh, expanding the capacity of the Rock, which in turn then gives, uh, provides enough uh, capacity for us to be added on as well. And as I mentioned before, we have started working with Metra on what those additional capacity improvements might, need, might be needed to handle uh, our trains in addition uh, to the Southwest service. And then bottom line on all of this is that by moving the Metra trains out of CUS and over to LaSalle Street, um, this creates slots at CUS for additional services that we wish to run, as I mentioned in the map before, whether, whether it's to uh, new cities or additional frequencies to existing cities, uh, the slots then would be much more readily available uh, at Union Station once the Southwest trains are over at LaSalle Street. Um, other elements then of the Chicago Access Program, uh, I referred to improvements at 16th Street. This is a conceptual diagram from one of our uh, engineers out east. What we would envision here is creating a much smoother, less sharp connection from the airline, St. Charles Airline, which is right here, down to the Metro Rock Island tracks, which are here. This yellow line would, would allow a service at 10 to 15 miles an hour instead of the current connector, which is in desperate need of renovation uh, and is capped at five miles an hour because of its, its very sharp turns. Uh, then down in Joliet uh, to get ready for uh, the St. Louis and Texas trains that would stop there, we would build a platform alongside the connecting track that goes from the Rock Island, the Metro's Rock Island corridor, just right here, just east of Joliet Station. Uh, we would build a platform here, stop here, and then make this curve to meet the Union Pacific tracks that have been upgraded to higher speeds, currently running at 90, 
but with a goal within the next few months actually to, to move another level up to 110 miles an hour. So this element then again, just allows us to get off the rock prior to uh, the Rock Island Metro Station, which is here. And uh, on a new platform, uh, uh, have our passengers uh, uh, get off and on in Joliet here. And then the trains just link from uh, via this curve down to the Union Pacific tracks to head down south to St. Louis. Uh, and finally, on, uh, on the Chicago access portion, portions of this, we move over to Southwest Michigan, where there's a significant chunk of territory. It's 19 miles long between Niles, where we stopped today. Uh, it includes Dwaziak, where we also stop. And it, it ends in Glenwood Road, where double track resumes. We wish to, to double track 16 of the 19 miles in this. Three miles here in Dwaziak were already double tracked. The, we would do the other 16 as part of this. Uh, we expect, since this would just be a restoration of a second track that was there for decades, that we would find a very easy environmental review of this one. Uh, we're thinking this will save us five minutes. Um, we're estimating the cost of this in total at about 169 million. The mega application budget, if you recall from the first slide, has a 20 million budget in there for the design and engineering portions of this. We would do the construction uh, through later funding uh, from a, a future grant application that we would do with Michigan DOT. And the, the, the teasing bullet here, if you will, is that this is only the first of several projects in Michigan uh, that we and Michigan DOT have in mind uh, to improve reliability and reduce travel time over there. Uh, I'm not going to go into them in detail in this presentation, but I'll just mention a couple of them. One would be to create a bypass in Battle Creek so that we can get off the one mile of freight railroad that we still run on uh, along the Wolverine route between Chicago and Pontiac that is in Battle Creek, where we have to get on the CN for literally one mile. And we would like to bypass that route so we're exclusively in public control uh, through, the, through Battle Creek. A second one is in Jackson, uh, which is notorious for being right in the middle of the state and thus right in the middle of uh, meets where trains going in opposite directions uh, are vying for the same track and thus have to wait for the other to clear. Uh, we would like to, uh, with Michigan, uh, realign the trackage at Jackson Station so that we can uh, use two tracks uh, and two platforms uh, for boarding and disembarking there. Uh, again, a reliability improvement and a travel time reduction as well. And there are several other projects in Michigan that we can go into at, at a later date if requested. So let us move on then to the improvements at Chicago Union Station. And I will confess before I start this part of the presentation that uh, one of my colleagues at Amtrak, Suzanne Mosher, uh, she's the Director of Portfolio Management uh, at Amtrak here in Chicago. She is uh, the uh, person in charge of the CUS package and uh, she is on vacation today, so I am covering CUS and if during the question sessions there are questions I cannot answer, I will be happy to uh, get those responses from her and her team and get those back to Rick uh, later on. But I will do my best with the Union Station package here. Um, this map of showing how the station tracks are laid out, this is uh, just to orient folks. Uh, this is Harrison Street at uh, uh, and just east of the south branch of the river. Um, and um, then CUS is over here on the right. The tracks then uh, are heading to the south uh, along, along the river. And the way this works, I think I pointed the wrong way. The south is this way. Let's try that again. Here's Union Station and we head that way south to, uh, to get out. Um, so the first package then of improvements, and this is included in the mega application is item one, and this is a set of concourse capacity improvements. And we'll, I'll show you a slide of, uh, that shows more detail on that uh, momentarily. We then, and this is very exciting, especially for the McCormick Place service, we wish to reactivate the old mail and express platform, which I'm circling with my cursor. Uh, these tracks have not been used in decades. Uh, those of you who have ever had the chance to 
to go into the bowels of the station know that there are still relics of the old post office mail sorting conveyor belts lurking above the platform here. Uh, we would renovate all of this, uh, turn it into active platform uh, space again, and it has an advantage in that it is already a high, a high level platform. So that will help in terms of uh, boarding and disembarking more quickly and would be the key really to getting uh, uh, the additional service and, and capacity needed to serve McCormick Place properly. We then want to, uh, items three through six, um, expand the width of the commuter platforms at CUS by taking advantage of the old baggage platforms that are there. I'll show you a picture of that momentarily. Um, and then the other component that's in the mega program is actually component eight. Uh, these are ventilation improvements. Uh, those of you familiar with, uh, with, the, with CUS know that for years we have had issues as, had, as has Metra uh, with the uh, entities in particular that own the properties above the tracks in terms of running exhaust systems properly and even when they are run properly. Uh, they are not very effective in clearing the area of uh, diesel exhaust. Uh, these improvements would improve that uh, uh, forever. So again, here's just another diagram showing uh, the mail platforms and the, the, the length of them. Uh, you can see they stretch all the way past Harrison Street under the old post office, obviously, because that's what they used to serve uh, and provide a tremendous opportunity for uh, expanded service, which we would augment with new passenger waiting areas and new uh, means by which passengers could enter and exit uh, station area and the mail platforms themselves by new via new egress uh, elements uh, on Harrison Street. Here's a, a look at the concourse uh, as it exists today. Uh, the concourse building, of course, is under what used to be the grand concourse building from way back when, which many of us wish were still here. Um, and what we would, the, the vision here is to really create a very clear east-west path through the station and into the waiting areas, uh, as well as the ability to see uh, north-south across the areas here. Right now it's so congested with escalators and offices and build outs, it's very hard to tell where you are at CUS unless you're really familiar with the facility. So what we will be doing is moving escalators. Uh, we will be clearing space uh, between uh, the north and south entrances, moving the escalators, expanding the waiting rooms so that the uh, experience of CUS uh, in terms of the actual waiting for the train uh, can be just as engaging and pleasant as it is in the restored headhouse building, uh, which as you know, uh, has the uh, restored great hall that was completed a few years ago. We, wanted, we want to bring the same level of tender loving care to the concourse area as well. So you can see these yellow areas are, are vacant, in fact, and will be cleared out so that the uh, space can be much more visible between the north and south tracks making traversing the station much easier and engaging for passengers. Here's a look at the baggage uh, platforms as they are today. Here on the left, you can see a Metro BNSF train unloading its uh, um, huge number of commuters and how crammed they are in this very narrow platform while this unused and crumbling old baggage platform is just sitting here waiting for people to be on it. So you can see then what we wanna do on the right is widen that, uh, that passenger platform, take advantage of that baggage area and make a much more pleasant and safe means of, uh, for Metro commuters going to and from their trains. The ventilation system improvements, this is more of a conceptual look at this. What we, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have in mind is to uh, bring in fresh air from above and then the, the, the new exhaust systems would push the exhaust air out into the open space uh, over the river, thus making the platform areas uh, much more environmentally friendly, much healthier, and so on. This has been an issue uh, off and on uh, for, for 
decades at Union Station, and it's one that we uh, believe we can now put in a position to address. And we're very excited about doing this. And then finally, here is the mega uh, application uh, uh, proposal. And MEGA, for those of you unfamiliar with this, um, with this program, is a new federal program that was uh, implemented by the Biden administration. It is specifically designed for very large uh, uh, transportation and rail projects in the nation. Happily, FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, which, will, uh, which is overseeing the program, encouraged us to apply for MEGA funding for this Chicago Access, Michigan, CUS, set of improvements. We are the lead applicant uh, on the grant uh, with both Illinois DOT and Michigan DOT serving as joint applicants with us. I mentioned before up front that the total budget for this is $418.5 million. We are seeking 60% of that funding through the mega grant of just over a quarter billion of federal assistance. We meantime have pledged 83, almost $84 million of our uh, federal uh, operating funds, uh, federal grant funds, I should say federal capital grant funds toward this project. And then I'm very happy to share that we have a huge number of uh, partner agencies supplying very significant dollars to this application, simply because they see the benefits of this for all of their constituents. So Illinois DOT, our largest uh, partner, of supplying $37 million of, of matching funds, both uh, Chicago DOT and Cook County, 15 million each, Metra, seven and a half million, Michigan DOT, uh, five million, and then we're uh, making up the rest by uh, using about four million of our program income, our non-federal dollars, meaning from revenue uh, in support of this application as well. We have heard uh, somewhat informally at this point that decisions are expected on this application in the second half of September. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that that will indeed be the case and obviously keeping fingers, toes and everything else we can think of crossed uh, that uh, this application will be approved for funding. And with that, that, that concludes my, my presentation. I'll put myself back on camera. I will stop sharing and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Joe. Um, I, I caught something new that, that I'm going to uh, take my privilege and ask about. Can you tell, tell more about the entrance at Harrison Street? Sure, I, I, uh, Susie Mosher would be more qualified than I in terms of the, the actual architecture there, but yes, we, we anticipate creating uh, access for passengers uh, other than on Jackson and Adams. We, we would like to create it. There, 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 there's a picture of it I did not include it in this particular deck, but we, we envision creating, Rick, a, a new waiting area specifically for the mail platforms to which people could both arrive and uh, leave up onto Harrison Street and not have to even go through CUS if they don't want to. Okay. Um, it's, I'm glad to hear that. A um, little bummed it's not on Van Buren through that beautiful lobby in the post office, but uh, that's, that's a big step is to be able to- well, it, and, and again, the, the plans are still very much in flux and it may turn out that Van Buren is just as attractive as Harrison or both. Because the mail platform is so long that there is room for both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, Peoria. So um, I'm very excited that Peoria is leading a very, very strong coalition to get service established there. Um, in their study, they talked about um, a connection of Joliet to the CN, which doesn't work. And then the old traditional or the way that was talked about as part of the 110 program of going across the Dan Ryan. Um, is this the capacity needed for Peoria service? Is that included in these plannings that you're having with Metro and using our economy? It, it isn't yet, uh, simply because um, on that one, with our state supported services, we usually take our cues and in. in brand new routes from the state DOT and 
to this point, IDOT has not yet formally requested us to look at Peoria. We'll, we'll be happy to work with them if they, if they so desire. Um, uh, and at that point, we'd analyze what the capacity might be needed on that with Metra as well. I think that the route that uh, at least that I've been uh, told on or read about is that it would take the Iowa interstate uh, through LaSalle in Peru uh, down and then go south into Peoria. Yeah. Um, it's actually, unfortunately, with multiple railroads because you've got CSX in the middle there. But um, and then the, another question came up, which I'll just kind of answer. Uh, we believe that they should consider much more frequent service to Moline over that route as well. Uh, but that's that's a, an opinion of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Nobody's looked at it yet. Um, and then Chris, uh, I, I guess we forgot to introduce Chris. Chris is our deputy director located up in Madison. Uh, mm -hmm. And he will uh, manage the questions uh, going forward. I will do my best. We uh, we have a really full house today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And we have a lot of questions. I, we probably cannot get to them all, but I will do our best. So uh, right, uh, let's jump right in. Uh, so uh, Lawrence Krieg asks uh, or observes and asks, Chicago has long suffered from disjointed passenger services. Has any consideration been given to moving sidewalks connecting with Ogilvy and the Blue Line Station? Um, I can answer on the Clinton side of things. Uh, I don't know if you recall, there is on, in the list of project components on the Union Station side, um, a better link to Clinton Street is definitely something we want to, to consider with CTA. And there have been discussions about that. The issue is that Clinton, as the, the, the Blue Line station there, is the deepest station in the CTA subway system. And thus the cost of connecting it to CUS uh, in a ADA accessible manner is extraordinarily expensive. Um, but it's certainly a goal of ours to, to see Clinton Street become far more integrated than it is uh, with CUS. Um, and I know we will be continuing to pursue that with CTA. Um, I'm not aware of any discussions in terms of linking uh, CUS with Ogilvy. I think all of us wish we weren't separated by two blocks. Um, but certainly that's something that uh, we can put uh, on an agenda going forward. It has not been discussed uh, very much yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've had a, a few questions about uh, through running capacity. Uh, so I was wondering if you could say more about that. Uh, what, you know, essentially what plans are there to, to try to increase the through running capacity? That, that'll be a key part actually of the, the planning for uh, the, uh, the airline connector project will be uh, how to better use the, the utilize the through tracks that, that are there uh, today. Um, and uh, we certainly envision that, um, it, well, generally, and again, this is just a vision, it's not a plan at this point, it's a vision, that uh, Metro service uh, would be the primary driver or the primary means of getting to and from McCormick Place from O'Hare, given that Metro has the service today that runs to, to that remote parking lot. But what we would look at, uh, and we'd want to study it carefully in terms of ridership and turnaround servicing and so on, is running some of our uh, Midwest corridor trains through CUS and out to the airport. All of this needs to be factored into an analysis um, of the through train capacity, the th uh, through track capacity, I should say, which we will do in conjunction with uh, the mail platform work. Uh, and the airline connector work in this 30% design phase that we hope to get into later this, uh, later this year following, we hope, receipt of the mega grant. Okay, thanks. And, uh, and, and speaking of uh, the hope for receipt of the mega grant, uh, Dave Golden asks a question about if, if the grant is approved in, in September or whenever that would happen, uh, how long would it take to implement the, the track connection improvements and the Chicago Union Station improvements that you've told us about? Yeah, it, it, it's a very complex project. It's a very good question. Um, we anticipate uh, 
a 12 to 18 month design period uh, for this, given the complexity, not only of, of building the uh, airline connector ramp uh, so that it does not overly interfere with yard operations, um, but um, also ensuring that even during construction, we are timing things such that uh, we aren't in the headlines every day uh, with this project causing uh, significant delays for people getting to and from their jobs downtown. That is not something uh, any of us uh, wants to see. Um, so uh, keys, key component actually the planning effort, and I think this will be frankly just as important as the planning of the, the ramp itself that connects the yards to the, to the airline bridge, will be planning around the operation. Uh, to make sure that uh, during construction, uh, we, uh, we can still uh, host and operate both our trains and Metro trains uh, as seamlessly as possible. Uh, so I said a 12 to 18 month window then for design and engineering. We thus anticipate starting construction probably in calendar 25-ish, goal being to be done uh, in 26 uh, and or early 27. Um, again, that's a goal at this point. No, no, no firm commitment yet as we're just starting the formal design process. But uh, our CEO, Stephen Gardner, has made it, I think, very clear in, in public statements and certainly to us uh, on the staff uh, that he wants to see Chicago on the way to being fixed within the next five years. And even though the work is complex and difficult, uh, that is a time frame that all of us have imprinted in our brains, believe me. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, another question about, you know, sort of related property and just the layout of, of downtown Chicago. Uh, David asks, given the possible decline in downtown office space needs, could Amtrak buy uh, and remove <laughs> the tower uh, directly above the area between the north and south platforms? Um, there are a number of us, I think, who would volunteer to bring hammers to start that demolition of 222 South Riverside. Um, that is not in our plan at this point. Um, we have just, as you know, uh, done the joint venture to build the new BMO tower, BMO tower just south of CUS, thus uh, removing that eyesore of a parking garage uh, from the neighborhood. Um, but at this point, uh, 222 is is not in our in our plan as much as I think a number of us, for both sentimental reasons and realistic reasons, would would love to see that uh, happen. Okay. So let's see. Uh, Kevin Monahan asks: Would East Coast Amtrak trains run over the Lakeshore Line and Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District as well? That's uh, a very good question. Um, we're in discussions right now with, with Nick D just about the Michigan trains. Um, I think it's safe to say that over time, assuming the operations can be integrated uh, efficiently and well without uh, overly interfering with Nick D, that ideally, yes, we would like to get the long distance trains off the Norfolk Southern as well, given how congested the Chicago line is. But we're taking this in steps at a time and uh, uh, the first goal would be to uh, work with them to ensure that uh, the Michigan trains can, can be run efficiently on there while also making sure that from a space point of view that uh, the Lakeshore and the Capitol and, uh, and whatever else might be intended down the road uh, could, could utilize the NICTI trackage as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a, a quick, hopefully quick follow-up question to that was, uh, would the Highliner cars be able to clear the overhead electric lines? Um, our plan is to, we, we would um, probably need to switch the capital limited from the superliners to do this, um, but uh, that will be studied as we talk with Nick D about how their capacity expansion is gonna work. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And uh, another uh, Indiana question, there actually there are several, I'm trying to batch these together. Uh, Todd Bassler uh, from the Indiana Passenger Rail Association asks, what is the plan for Fort Wayne and East? Um, that is, 
it, it is being looked at at the request of the local stakeholders there. Um, but as of the moment, it is not it is not formally in the plan simply because we do not have a state partner uh, at Indiana DOT at this moment. Um, and as I mentioned up front with the Peoria question, we really take our cues on many of these new route ideas from the from the state DOT, which needs to support the service financially. Um, we now having said that, our hope is, and again, this, this involves the discussions with Nick D. When I mentioned before that we want to resume service to Indianapolis, that of course would require working with, with Indiana DOT again, as they were a state partner with the old Hoosier State Service. Um, we are just starting discussions with them on the possibility of using the NICD uh, Westlake extension down to Dyer uh, for eventual uh, Hoosier State restoration. That still though is several years out and would but could provide a vehicle for further discussions within DOT about supporting uh, Fort Wayne uh, service. It's something certainly that we are aware of. We've provided information to the stakeholders along that corridor who requested it, uh, but we're really taking, we read, we have to by, by, by virtue of the, uh, the law involved. Uh, we're taking our cue on that officially from Indiana DOT, you know, which has not asked us to officially to look at, the, uh, at that route yet. Okay, and, and speaking of your work and partnership with other states, uh, Dawn asks, is Ohio participating? Not in this program, but uh, our government affairs folks are working very closely with the Ohio Rail Development Commission and others over in Ohio uh, on various routes there, uh, whether it's the, the three C plus D, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, um, or the, the, uh, the, the route that I, routes I was showing before, uh, as well as um, improving service to Cleveland. Um, all of those are in discussion at the moment. Um, I'm not part of those discussions as more of our government affairs folks at this early stage, uh, but certainly Ohio is, is uh, uh, a place where we would very much like to see service expanded, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I uh, thank you. And I think that uh, prompted by what you shared about the mail platforms, uh, Karen Headland asks, what provision will there be at Union Station for level boarding platforms? Karen, uh, good to hear your name. I haven't spoken with you in quite a while. Um, that's more of a question for Suzanne Mosher. I would have to pursue that. Uh, I know that the, uh, the mail platforms, as I mentioned, are high level. Um, so uh, that, will, that will help us with some of our equipment. Um, there is not a plan at the moment to convert the other platforms to uh, high level as well. Um, just to, to expand the platform widths uh, of the existing platforms. But we would uh, for sure make the mail platforms high level um, as part of this uh, reactivation program. Um, I can get more information if that's requested. Thanks. I hope I'm getting the pronunciation of this name right, but uh, Przemyslav asks, uh, are there any plans circulating to electrify shorter routes, for example, the route to Rockford? N not that involve Amtrak, not, so not that I know of. Okay. And um, let's see, next one. Uh, the Michigan line uh, is mostly state slash Amtrak owned, which is a, a rarity outside of the Northeast corridor. Uh, and seems like a great opportunity, says this questioner, uh, to demonstrate to the rest of the country what top tier service could really look like. Uh, are, there, are there plans on that front to do more of that? Not at this time, simply because as Rick mentioned up front, uh, true high speed rail requires dedicated line, no crossings, et cetera. So the, the current vision is to uh, get that higher speed service, the 110 service, uh, uh, in as many areas of the Michigan line as we can do it, get that travel time down. And then if the nation wants to move toward uh, true high-speed rail by building brand new corridors, uh, certainly we'd be willing to obviously work with folks on that, but it is not in our plans uh, to go to, to true high-speed at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, well, here's a related question. Uh, in, in addition to improving the current choke points that slow things down, as you described, is there, is there more that uh, can be said about increasing speed? Uh, David Capelli uh, asks, has Amtrak considered retrofitting tracks to allow higher speeds? Uh, can you can you say more about uh, uh, reaching higher in, in terms of speed, I guess, is, is what people are wondering. Um, I, I guess I'm not sure which which trackage he may be asking about, because that, that's that's, of course, already in process or done or close to done uh, between Chicago and St. Louis and Chicago and Detroit. Is he referring to other corridors? Um, I'm not clear about that. Oh, the entire network, he says in the chat. Yeah, I think that was the answer network. with the previous question. If you really want to go fast, you got to build a new railroad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that really is the case. And because uh, the, the investments to, to move to high, even higher speed, as, as I think all of you know, are, are, are very large. And uh, <laughs> to, to build true high speed is, is essentially almost brand new construction, given that you have to totally eliminate grade crossings and so on. Well, we'll keep working away at that. Uh... <laughs> Building support for that. We, we would like to see, by the way, we, we would like to, if we if we uh, can do the uh, Indianapolis service at some point, that that we think is a route that would be, given that improvements need to be done on the, the, the CSX Monon sub so significantly anyway, um, to get it to a, a decent rate of speed, that would, we think, be a very nice candidate for, for higher speed service as well. Okay, great. So moving on, uh, Ulysses asks: uh, Many railroads in other countries make most of the most of their revenue with the uh, the station buildings or from the station buildings, the shops, the restaurants, offices, things like that. Uh, could Amtrak take advantage of its station assets to a, a greater extent? Well, that, that's actually what we've done in Chicago, and I, I did, this is one where I particularly wish uh, Suzanne were available um, because uh, that was the whole purpose of the of the BMO Tower uh, is. Uh, really taking advantage of the airspace uh, above that old parking garage, that parking structure. Um, and uh, it, it's been a very nice uh, agreement uh, in terms of transit oriented development there. So um, yes, it's very much something we, we are pursuing. The, the issue is, is that out here, unlike in the Northeast, we don't own that much in terms of assets. Uh, we own CUS and about a mile of the trackage under it. Uh, and on either side of it, but we, it's not like out east where we own big chunks of territory. Okay. So Frank Ingram asks, what happens to the Amtrak owned trackage from Porter to Michigan City if uh, the Michigan service trains bypass that? Very perceptive question. Um, uh, there is a, a long-term plan that we have explored with others um, to at some point explore building our own right of way. Uh, what's called, for those of you familiar with the parlance, the ComEd right of way uh, along the embankment where the Norfolk Southern tracks are today. There is room for us to build there. It is a massively expensive project and will take many years to get done but it is certainly in our vision at some point in the future. Uh, and this would be a, a great candidate, obviously, for higher speed access uh, in and out of the city as well. To link uh, that command right of way uh, to uh, directly where our ownership would start in Porter. So we have no plans to give up that trackage from Porter to Michigan City. But in the, in the near term, we would probably end up not using it if we moved to NICD. If at some point we were to uh, obtain the funding uh, to build our own trackage, our own right of way um, up on that embankment, um, then we would go all the way from uh, essentially Grand Crossing all the way over to Porter on our own, owner, on our own ownership. If, if I can interject for a second, you said massively expensive. Um, I think that highway guys and airport guys would see it as a cheap project. So. Well, they would, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it ain't that expensive compared to other things. That is true. The value you get. 
But again, I'll go back in all seriousness to uh, what, what Mr. Gardner has said is that he wants Chicago on the path to being fixed within five years. And uh, what we're doing now will, will get us, uh, will get us uh, considerably better than we are today and can set the stage for future improvements uh, later on. Because there are not, we, believe me, we've had uh, a number of discussions internally about um, eventually uh, doing that massive kind of construction uh, between Grand Crossing and, and, uh, and Porter. And there is a path to do it if, if, uh, if the funding at some point becomes available. It, you know, I, I have to point out, I've seen a, a pretty credible business plan for a high-speed line through there running. So you, at Kensington, you'd hit the accelerator and you'd get to 200 miles an hour before you get to Gary. Uh, so that is physically possible as well. It is. But we need to build a coalition of folks to create an, you know, to make that happen. And, uh, um, well, we're right close to the end. Chris, was there any pressing question that, that we haven't covered yet? Or because I'd like to point out a, a, a step that folks can take. All right, we have we have dozens more questions, so clearly we can't get to them all. So, uh, well, let's just uh, why don't you bring us home, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So, I'll share my screen for a second. Um, I want to show you if if everybody today could uh, type into their browser highspeedrail.us, um, and that brings you to our website. And I'm sorry, this is in edit mode, so ignore the edit keys. Come down here to Chicago Access. We have a brief page on this. Um, and to be clear, this is from our perspective. So we're very excited this is moving forward. And we talk a little bit more about the stuff that can move forward in the process. But here's the important couple of things down here that I would like our members to help with. Uh, the first is, uh, normally you don't make a petition like this uh, public without having uh, any signatures on it. So if you all could help us get to a couple of hundred signatures, if everybody did that, that's on the call right now, it'd be 211 signatures. If you can uh, add your name to this petition that says, Pete Buttigieg, make sure you fund this. That's step number one. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, reach out to your mayor uh, especially if your mayor has an Amtrak station or a metro station where you can get on a train and take it to Union Station. Um, and again, we normally don't publicize this before we've got endorsements, but you can help get us started on this. Uh, there is a sample letter here that you can share with your mayor. Um, we can help coordinate a presentation either with us or Amtrak or whatever makes sense for meeting with those mayors. Uh, more organizations, rotary clubs, et cetera. We need to get the word out on this very quickly. And so there's this page here where you've got a sample letter um, and other ways that you can contact us to get more people involved. So those are two of the three things I would like you to do today. Number one, sign the petition. Number two, get a local agency involved in promoting this. And number three, uh, come up here after you've done those to the uh, join us button and make a donation so that we can continue to work on this. And so that this project sets the stage for really exciting things. Um, we're so excited that this is happening and we need to make it bigger than it is. Um, and let's make it happen by getting people anywhere that you can get on a train. If it's Seattle, Portland, LA, Albuquerque, all those places you can get on a train to Union Station, let's get the local mayors there involved in pushing for this. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Joe, uh, thank for the you. presentation. Um, and we look forward to presenting more information on this as, as it progresses. So thank you. Take care and thanks everybody. Yep. Bye.